Multiple sclerosis for the newly diagnosed rapid fire. Let's have some fun. MS was first described by the French physician Jean-Martin Charcot in 1868 when he did a brain autopsy on a female patient who had tremor, slurred speech, and abnormal eye movements, and he found plaques, which were hardened sclerotic areas in multiple areas, hence the term multiple sclerosis. In modern times, we can see the plaques or lesions in living people with MS on MRI scans. You're looking at slices through the brain like this, and on T2 sequences, the lesions look bright and they're often in certain areas they're larger well demarcated between normal and abnormal tissue often touching the ventricles or fluid filled spaces in the corpus callosum brainstem optic nerve and spinal cord when lesions are new there's often active inflammation and a breakdown of the blood brain barrier the normal barrier between the blood and the nervous system and the dye gadolinium can extravasate into the central nervous system and cause the lesions to light up or enhance often for around one month we we can often see lesions on the spine, as shown here, and lesions in the optic nerve. This person has right optic neuritis. Even in someone who's stable, lesions are often coming and going spontaneously. This is a study of someone with stable relapsing MS having an MRI every two weeks for a year. They reported no new symptoms, but you can see the lesions come and go. So even remission may be active in the physiologic sense. But beware that many people without MS also have white matter lesions on the MRI of their brain. For example, this MRI on the bottom shows typical white matter lesions in multiple sclerosis, but these slices of the MRI scan on top show smaller, poorly demarcated, fluffy lesions in the subcortical white matter, not typical of multiple sclerosis. These are known as unidentified bright objects, or UBOs. And because of this, multiple sclerosis is very commonly misdiagnosed. In fact, a study at Cedars sinai and UCLA in Los Angeles of the United States found that 18% of people diagnosed with multiple sclerosis were actually misdiagnosed and their study found various alternate diagnoses such as migraine, spine arthritis, peripheral neuropathy, and various rare neurological diseases. Although the exact cause of MS is unknown and believed to be due to complicated genetic and environmental factors, we believe that it is immune mediated. In other words, the immune system is getting confused and attacking the central nervous system and the main target of attack is myelin or the fatty sheath of nerve fibers shown here. Here you can see a nerve fiber in red coated by a blue fatty substance known as myelin. And in the central nervous system, myelin is created by cells called oligodendrocytes. And often there can be spontaneous regeneration of myelin or remyelination, which is why recovery is possible in MS, especially relapsing multiple sclerosis. But sometimes the injury can be permanent and even the underlying axon or nerve fiber can be damaged. The main biomarker of MS is known as oligoclonal bands in the cerebral spinal fluid. The spinal fluid can be obtained by doing a spinal tap, a test sometimes used to help confirm the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. When this fluid is pasted on a gel and exposed to an electric field, a procedure known as electrophoresis, you can see several bands known as oligoclonal bands, and these correspond to abnormal immunoglobins that target antigens in the central nervous system that are not present in the blood, which is why MS MS is an autoimmune disease only of the central nervous system. The epidemiology of MS is similar to other immune-mediated diseases such as thyroiditis and lupus in that it's more common in young women. About 75% of people with a diagnosis are women, and the average age of symptom onset is around 30, although it's rare prior to puberty but fairly common in teenagers, and I sometimes see symptom onset in the 60s and 70s. It was previously thought that MS was more common in people of European descent, but our data in Southern California Kaiser Permanente show that African Americans and Hispanics have roughly equal risk, though it is more rare in Native Americans and Asians. In the United States, about 1 in 350 people have MS, and it's not strongly associated with other autoimmune diseases. The risk of MS varies tremendously throughout the globe and is most common in developed countries far from the equator, such as the United States, Canada, and Northern Europe, and is comparatively rare in undeveloped countries and in countries close to the equator. For example, in Cuenca, Ecuador, the risk is only 25,000 to 1 compared to about 222 to 1 in Syracuse, New York, suggesting that lifestyle and modern society may play a significant role in the risk of getting MS. And we've identified many known risk factors for developing MS. For example, low sunlight exposure, living far from the equator, and having low blood levels of vitamin D are associated with MS. And these things are connected because sun exposure to the skin causes vitamin D production. 
It's also known that people who have MS with lower levels of vitamin D have a worse prognosis on average, and hence supplementation with vitamin D is often recommended. Also, the virus Epstein-Barr virus, EBV, which causes the disease mono or glandular fever, is known to be associated with MS. In fact, nearly 100% of adults with MS have evidence of prior exposure to the virus based on blood serology, regardless of whether or not they had symptoms in the past, and those with an actual clinical history of mono have approximately double the risk of getting MS. Although MS is not genetic, many genes have been associated with MS, particularly genes having to do with regulation of the immune system. For example, the gene most associated with risk of MS is HLA DRB1-1501, which is part of the major histocompatibility complex type 2, and if you have both copies of the high-risk allele, you have an eight-fold increased risk of MS. Family history of multiple sclerosis is also a factor. People born in May have a slightly increased risk of MS, presumably because their mother was pregnant during the winter and had lower levels of vitamin D. We also know that smoking increases the risk of MS slightly, and people with MS who smoke do slightly worse on average. We also think because MS is more common in developed countries, hygiene may may be a factor. The theory goes that we're too clean and we don't get exposed to parasites and other antigens when we're young, and that may change the development of our immune system and make us more prone to autoimmune diseases in general. The following diagram describes the risk of MS in people with a family history of the disease. For example, if you have an identical twin with multiple sclerosis, your risk is around 25%, 1 in 4. For fraternal or non-identical twins, the risk is 2 to 5%. For first-degree relatives, parents, siblings, or children, the risk in a female is around 3%, and in a male, the risk is around 1%. For second-degree relatives, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, and half-siblings, the risk is around 1%, and for more distant relatives, the risk is similar to the general population. There are two main ways that people get worsening symptoms with multiple sclerosis, attacks and progression. An attack is new inflammation in the nervous system causing neurological symptoms that usually develop subacutely over days to weeks. It often peaks and then improves over time, but not necessarily improves to 100% of baseline. I use the term exacerbation, flare, and relapse to mean exactly the same thing as an attack. Some common multiple sclerosis attacks are optic neuritis, inflammation of the optic nerve that causes pain and vision loss usually in one eye. Transverse myelitis is inflammation of the spine that typically causes numbness or weakness in the limbs and sometimes bladder problems. Lesions in the brainstem often cause vertigo, imbalance, clumsiness, and double vision, though many other symptoms of multiple sclerosis are possible. Progression, on the other hand, is a slow and insidious change over months or years that is often recognized retrospectively. The most common symptoms would be worsening walking, worsening cognitive symptoms, or worsening clumsiness. Generally speaking, younger people are more likely to have relapses, and older people with MS are more likely to have progression though there's a lot of person-to-person variability, and you can have both relapses and progression at the same time. There's very strong evidence that MS is all a single clinical pathologic entity, but sometimes it's helpful to describe clinical subtypes based on the development of the symptoms. These graphs show different subtypes of MS with disability on the left, the y-axis, and time on the x-axis. For instance, some people have so-called benign multiple sclerosis, meaning they have periods of stability, they may periodically have relapses where their symptoms get worse, but they always return to baseline and have low disability even after many decades. Unfortunately, some people can have benign MS and worsen later on. The most common form of MS at the time of diagnosis is relapsing remitting MS. Here, people are stable, but then have relapses, but they may not always return to normal and may have an increased level of baseline disability. Sometimes they may return 100%, sometimes not. Hence, the term remission is a little misleading because people may still have significant symptoms even between attacks. Some people with relapsing remitting MS as they get older may start slowly declining even if they stop having relapses. This is known as secondary progressive multiple sclerosis because they have progression that's secondary to the first form of MS, which is relapsing MS. And some
some people never really have a relapse in their lifetime. They just start getting slowly worsening symptoms. And this is called primary progressive multiple sclerosis because the first form of MS was progressive. Attacks can sometimes be mild and improve spontaneously, but for more severe prolonged attacks, we often give treatment, and the standard treatment is high-dose steroids. For example, intravenous solumedrol or methylprednisolone can be given 1 gram or 1,000 milligrams daily for 3 to 5 days. High-dose steroids irritate the stomach and can sometimes cause ulcers, and so gastrointestinal prophylaxis, often with Prilosec, is used. A European study actually found that oral methylprednisolone at the same dose, 1 gram, is equally effective and safe, and because methylprednisolone often comes in tiny tablets, so you have to take a lot of them to get 1 gram, sometimes we use prednisone, and the equivalent dose of prednisone is 1250 milligrams or 25 50 milligram tablets, and this is again taken daily for 3 to 5 days, usually in the morning because steroids can cause insomnia. For severe relapses that don't get better with steroids, we have alternate treatments, and one of them is plasmapheresis or plasma exchange, which is a dialysis-like procedure that removes abnormal antibodies, cytokines, and other pro-inflammatory factors. And in rare cases for very severe relapses, there are other strong chemotherapy drugs we might try. Unfortunately, even between attacks in remission, symptoms of MS are often present, even if there isn't new active inflammation in the nervous system. This is a list of some common symptoms. For instance, neurogenic bladder or bladder problems related to spinal cord injury is very common. Some common symptoms include urinary frequency, having to go often, urinary hesitancy, difficulty emptying the bladder, and frequent urinary tract infections. Another symptom is layer meets phenomenon, which is having neurological symptoms with flexion of the neck, often tingling down the spine or into the limbs, and this is associated with cervical myelitis. Utah's phenomenon is worsening neurological symptoms in the setting of increased body temperature, such as heat or exercise. The theory here is that with demyelination, there's often recovery and the tissue may function well, but in the setting of increased body temperature, it may decompensate and not send the signal properly. And some people can have profound changes in vision or motor symptoms with increased temperature, though it's not necessarily doing any harm in the long run. Sexual problems are common in MS and fatigue is very common in MS. People with MS can often have cognitive symptoms, sometimes very subtle symptoms, such as difficulty with with processing speed or multitasking, sometimes what's known as brain fog, and mood disorders are a little bit more common in MS than the general population, the most common being depression. Now you may ask, what is the prognosis of MS? How bad is it? Well, there's a lot of variation from person to person, but I'll show you a few studies showing the averages, but first you have to learn about this disability scale used in multiple sclerosis research called the EDSS, or Expanded Disability Status Scale. This is a highly simplified version, but basically it's a 0 to 10 scale scale where a greater number refers to more disability. At zero, there is no disability. Three to four could be considered moderate disability. At six, a cane is required to walk 100 meters. And at 6.5, a walker is required. And at 7.0, a wheelchair is used. So this is data from the MS EPIC study at the University of California, San Francisco, looking at the prognosis of relapsing onset multiple sclerosis, people who get diagnosed with relapsing MS. And they're looking at how long it takes on average for people to get to EDSS 6, in other words, require a cane, and the graph is people who do not need a cane, so it starts off at 100% not needing a cane, and it slowly goes down. After 10 years, only 4.7% required a cane. After 20 years, it was 16.2%, but after 40 years, it was over 50%, and again, there's a tremendous amount of individual variability. There are definitely a lot of people with MS who do really, really well, even after many decades. But with progressive multiple sclerosis, the data are unfortunately unfortunately a little bit more sobering. This is data from the same study at University of California, San Francisco, and they looked at 61 people with progressive multiple sclerosis, and they divided them based on their baseline EDSS score. So for people with low EDSS, between 1.5 and 2.5, 100% got worse. You can see people who got worse in dark gray versus people who are better or the same in light gray. And that makes sense because you can't really have progressive multiple sclerosis and stay at low disability forever. But for people with greater disability, between 3 and greater than 4, 
most people did get worse and only around 30% stayed the same and got better. This is a different study looking at people with progressive MS and looking at what percentage required a wheelchair by a certain age. This is not duration of disease, this is just absolute chronological age. And you can see it starts off at 100% not requiring a wheelchair and then by age 50 only about 12.5% require a wheelchair but by age 60 it's around 25% and by age 80 it's greater than 50%. That being said, there are many people with progressive MS who are surprisingly stable. Because of the epidemiology of MS and the rising prevalence in developed countries, many people believe that lifestyle could be a significant factor and some people advocate for specific diets. Now there's no single proven diet, but I want to tell you about a few of the more popular approaches. The Swank diet is a low saturated fat diet advocated by Dr. Roy Swank, a neurologist who published a long-term though unrandomized trial showing it could be effective for multiple sclerosis. Dr. Terry Walls, pictured to the right, is a physician who claims to have reversed her secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. You can see her pictured in a tilt-recline wheelchair in 2007 and riding a bicycle in 2008. She advocates for a whole foods paleolithic diet, avoidance of toxins, and functional electrical stimulation. Another approach is overcoming multiple sclerosis, which is advocated by Professor George Jelinek from Australia, who believes in a whole foods, plant-based diet plus seafood. He also recommends vitamin D supplementation, exercise, and sunlight exposure. If you want more details, please check out my other videos on these topics. We also have many medications that keep MS in check, blocking inflammation and preventing attacks and new lesions on the MRI known as disease-modifying therapies. These are protective agents that are purely preventative, kind of like taking aspirin to prevent a heart attack. They don't grow new nerve tissue, but there is a lot of research in the field of remyelination and neuroregeneration. These disease modifying therapies come in different forms and there are over 20 of them. Some of them are injectables, medications you take yourself by injection, pills or infusion medications, medications given slowly through the IV. This list is an approximate ranking of the efficacy of different disease modifying therapies in my personal opinion based on comparison of head to head trials. The most effective agent is probably hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Some other high efficacy treatments include Lymtrata, Alimtuzumab, Ocrevus, Casimpta, Rituximab, Cladribine, and Tysabri. Of course, these medications all have their own side effects. Please feel free to check out my other videos. There are also many treatments that don't target the underlying disease, but help with some of the most common symptoms of MS. For example, fatigue can be treated with B12 shots. Certain diets, in particular a whole foods plant-based diet and the Terry Walls diet, has some evidence for MS fatigue. Also, low doses of the drug naltrexone and sometimes stimulants like Ritalin, Adderall, and Provigil. Bladder symptoms caused by neurogenic bladder can be treated with anticholinergics such as trospium chloride or Sanctura and sometimes bladder Botox. There are many treatments for nerve pain including the supplement alpha lipoic acid, acupuncture, or drugs like gabapentin and nortriptyline. Muscle spasticity, stiffness, and cramps can be treated with the drug baclofen, botulinum toxin injections, and medical marijuana. There's a specific drug for slow gait in MS called called Ampira or Dalfampridine that sometimes helps with walking speed. And I'll briefly mention a few miscellaneous issues. For example, vaccine studies generally suggest that they're safe in MS and don't increase the risk of relapses, the exception being the yellow fever vaccine. One study showed that this increases the risk of relapses in MS. And also many people with MS take immunosuppressants and hence cannot take vaccines that have live viral components. Also, even though smoking increases MS progression, Alcohol doesn't seem to have any clear connection between the risk of MS and prognosis in multiple sclerosis, though of course excessive consumption has its own risks. And I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any other questions, please post in the comments below.